And finally, the last king of Israel, and I'm going to mention his name, but I'm sure he won't be on any of your lists. His name is Hosea, the last king of Israel. And he just pushed it a little bit too far. He declared a little bit too much independence at a time when Assyria had a little bit too much resources to dedicate to this region. And he just pushed it a little bit too far. And the Israelite troops under uh, Sennacherib, that's another one of those neatest, I love the Assyrian names. Oh, this should be an I. Sennacherib. They utterly destroyed the northern kingdom. Just, I mean, burnt every city down, killed the royal family, took virtually all the people of the north in chains into some northern province of Assyria. And you know what happened? Well, uh, let, me, let me finish the story of, the, of Sennacherib's campaign. Then he moved down into the south. I mean, you've gone this far, you might as well take the rest of the territory. And he moves south and he trashes Judah. Because remember all those neat fortified cities that Solomon had built that have been continuously occupied and garrisoned by the, uh, the Judean forces uh, ever since their inception? Well, he just smashes everything. He just scatters the troops uh, all running into the cities. The only thing he doesn't do is, is lay siege to any of the important cities. Now, very, very difficult. If you ever see any movies about uh, uh, Western movies about uh, sieges of forts in the West or movies about knights and castles, it's, it's very difficult to break into a fortified city. I mean, you, because at, at, at certain significant points in the operation, there's no way for you to not to expose yourself to injury. You get a you know, story of pouring boiling water and oil down on these people, trying to climb up ladders or trying to batter down uh, doors and shooting arrows down and poking them with sticks and pouring hot coal down on... You know, I, mean, I would not want to be in, 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 a, in, a, in a troop of soldiers that was attacking a fortified city. It's just... Uh, uh, so, they, pretty much they bypassed them. And then they came to Jerusalem. There's one other way to take a fortified city, uh, and that's by laying siege. You just surround the city, you cut off any place of uh, egress, any way that they can get out or in. You cut off their sources of food, you cut off their sources of water, and you wait. And these cities were very well provisioned, but if you wait long enough, eventually the provisions are going to run out. And we're talking about three years. Now this is not uh, terribly unusual. There was a one-year siege of Stalingrad in World War II. There was a, what, what was it, about 11 or 12 month siege of Sarajevo that was just lifted. I mean, this is still a military tactic. It's, it's a tactic of terror. Because what happens to the people inside when they start starving to death? It doesn't only affect them physically, but the entire social fabric starts breaking down. Eventually, they're going to be so weakened that you could just get in. They're defenseless. But what happens more likely is at a certain point, they just give up. They say, we surrender. So they lay siege to Jerusalem. And the king of Judah, whose name, well, there were a few of them because, as I said, the siege lasted a while. Uh, well, first there was Ahaz and then there was Hezekiah. But anyway, the king of Jerusalem has to decide what to do. And he's just about ready to make a similar mistake that the northern kingdom made. And that is to call Egypt for help. Egypt has had a very funny relationship to all the stuff that's going on. Uh, they would never actually move into the region themselves, but they kept trying to get all of these little nations to form alliances to fight the Assyrians as kind of a Egyptian proxies. And then the Egyptians keep saying they'll support you, we'll, say, we'll give you provisions, we'll back you up with troops, just promising all that stuff. But anyway, the king of Israel, was, or the king of Judah, was tempted to ask Egypt for help. Uh, Isaiah, and we'll talk more about the role of prophets uh, after the next test. But the prophet Isaiah, who works as the court prophet in Jerusalem at this time, begs the king not to do this. 
and promises that if the king doesn't do this, that Yahweh himself will deliver Jerusalem from, it, from the Assyrian siege. And sure enough, the Assyrian siege is suddenly lifted. And there are two different versions of that lifting in uh, Second Kings. In the first version, uh, Yahweh strikes the Assyrian army with a plague and virtually all of them die and the rest of them just flee back north. Uh, the other version says that there was a, uh, a revolution taking place or a coup back in Nineveh. And so the king had to pull up his troops and go rushing back to establish himself. So these are the two stories. I'm, I'm not in any position to tell you which one is true or if either one is. But this is the way it works. So they pull out from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is saved. Now let's get back to the north. What happened to the northern Israelites who were taken captive by the Assyrians? And the answer is, no one knows. And it's fairly simple to figure out, but there's no evidence, either literary or archaeological. What probably happened is they just said, screw you, Yahweh. I mean, you're supposed to protect us from things like this. And here we are in a foreign country. Here we are slaves. Here we are all our temples and holy places that we built to you destroyed. Uh, why should we worship you anymore? Remember what I said, when two gods... Are, 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 when two nations are fighting, it's understood that the gods of those nations are locked in battle. And when one of those nations wins, it's assumed that God is more powerful and has won. So if Asher, the god of Nineveh, is so much more powerful than Yahweh, then let's just start worshipping Asher. Or let's just start worshipping some of the local gods in the place where we live now. They couldn't do any worse for us than Yahweh did. But once they stopped worshipping Yahweh, they ceased to be Israelites. Poof, gone. And so we have no trace of them. They just blended into the background. So probably, uh, if we had some absolute power to trace people's lineage backwards, probably all sorts of people living in the northern Arab regions uh, and Turkey, and all, of the, all around there probably have some uh, authentic Israelite blood from that time as they just kind of blended into the surroundings. So that's what happened in the north. It ceases to exist. If you've ever heard references to the ten lost tribes of Israel and all sorts of theories about you know, where these lost tribes ever turned up, well, these are the ten lost tribes of Israel. They're gone. Uh, one other thing to say about that is there certainly were some who fled south and who managed to survive in some of the Judean walled cities. And it's probably as a result of them that we have an awful lot of the stories in Exodus and an awful lot of the stories in Judges and Samuel and First and Second Kings and even some of the prophets like Amos and Hosea, which we're doing after the, the test. I mean, all of those things were probably brought down from the north by exiles, by refugees. 